Goalie.com has just launched. It is the second longevity competition in history. Sean Patrick, you've embarked on a journey overtaking the rejuvenation Olympics created by Brian Johnson, the most prominent longevity advocate and true diagnostic, a hundred million dollar company. What makes you think you can do that? <laughs> I love that exciting introduction. Well, uh, first and foremost, I'm extremely grateful for the uh, the promotion and all the awesome stuff Brian Johnson and True Diagnostic are doing, sponsoring this uh, really awesome uh, Rejuvenation Olympics to bring awareness and bring people into the fold, learning more about it. My goal with my uh, longevity database at goalie.com is to actually crowdsource not just epigenic results uh, like your uh, your rate of aging and not just showcase who's the slowest which is awesome but also bring into the fold how did they get there not just the what the rate of aging but the how what are their diet routines what are their health um protocols what um you know what are their exercise routines or do they take supplements do they take other interventions like rapamycin you know all these things can help us not just um you know, get excited about the longevity field and, and speed of aging and diagnostics like the Rejuvenation Olympics is doing, but also learn from each other. And, you know, there's a lot of evidence that there's so much interest in this additional information based on all of the news articles that just were sprung out and burst after the launching of the Rejuvenation Olympics. People wanted to know who is Julie Gibson Clark, who, by the way, um, has... Uh, filled out this longevity survey about herself, one of the slowest aging people around, even beating at one point, I don't know if she's still beating him, uh, Brian Johnson, who's been spending just like a, you know, a very modest, um, you know, hundred or so dollars on uh, diet and supplements and so and still um, beating him. No offense, Brad Johnson, I'm sure you're doing awesome too. But uh, it's exciting. The more we can learn, uh, the more we can all benefit and raise awareness uh, about the exciting field of longevity. So we're going to talk about all that, but let's start with a why, with a why on a personal level. Why did you take on the responsibility to do this yeah so i guess i'm kind of a data geek at heart i love kind of bring up bringing information and i'm i'm no longer a spring chicken you know i'm 39 years old so i think as you get a little older you start thinking more about your health i i think i'm in pretty decent shape now but i i really want to get ready for that centurion centenarian decathlon as dr peter tia liked to put it so that I'm not just okay now, I'm really hedging my bets for the future and all the exciting possibilities that and advancements that could come along in the future. And I started doing my own little research as, a, as an enthusiast. I don't have a scientific background. I'm not a doctor, nor do I play one on TV. But I think it's really exciting. And I think if we can pull all this disparate information, that at least like there's hundreds of really exciting, interesting like um, articles or posts people share about their own longevity, health pro health protocols and routines, and that's awesome, but you can't just ask uh, Google or Bing, like, what percentage of the slowest aging individuals over 50 are taking NMN or taking rapamycin or do calorie restriction? You can't pull these statistics through hundreds or thousands of disparate blog articles or websites. You really need to have them centralized in a database or connected databases to really analyze and look at interesting correlations, even if they're not necessarily causational, you can really get a lot of exciting food for thought, which may prompt uh, interesting, you know, new interesting studies in the future or help people connect longevity enthusiasts in similar situations, connect to each other who are in similar circumstances. So, uh, yeah, there's a lot of um, exciting possibility, I feel, and I think even just like helping bring them together can help spark an exciting uh, array of possibilities through the centralized 
compilation of all this different information together. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, what, what's the centenarian decathlon that you mentioned? Yeah, so I'm not sure if you've heard of Dr. Peter Atia or his book Outlive. He's uh, he's a doctor who specializes in longevity, and it is a great book that came out I think a couple a couple of years ago about his history exploring it and his thought process is, you know, if you want to be able to do the things that allow you to enjoy life and to engage with life uh, in a healthy way, you should really be taking your uh, health protocols very seriously, even as you're younger, so you can prepare for those um, those things when you're older, so you don't get hurt, so you can participate in life, so you can engage with the world, with your loved ones, if you want to be able to hold your grandkids and play with them at 100 years old, you should plan ahead so that you have all, as much possibility, as much health, as much joy and vitality you can when you get there, instead of and factor in the, the the challenges that will occur incrementally as you get older. So preparing for that now and really putting effort and thought into your health now ahead of time. That makes sense. Okay, so this is about some later stages of your life. Uh-huh. Yeah, uh-huh. for sure. All right, all right. So first, let's just talk about longevity as a whole. So where are, where are we have you achieved longevity escape velocity already? Not as far as I know. Again, I'm a layman. I don't have a scientific background. I, if someone finds out otherwise, please shoot me an email <laughs> so I can take whatever protocols that help me reach that escape, uh, longevity escape velocity potential. So I, I think there's, um, I think rapamycin and these studies that are coming about, about like calorie restriction and all these like other interventions, like maybe stem cells and peptides, I think they're really intriguing. I think it's, it's does does one of these protocols that are being experimented now, could they be the key? Quite possibly. It seems like, from what I've seen, there may be promising, but they haven't, like, gotten quite to the point of, like, the extent of, you know, human trials or later trials that have gotten to the point where they're uh, exhaustively validated yet. But maybe one of these protocols that are already being studied on could be the key. They're just not validated, and we just, I guess, the accessibility for people to try it out or the affordability, even if it is technically available in some parts of the world, is a real challenge. It's fun seeing people go to these other countries that are a little bit more open-minded, that they can do these trials or they can you know, bank their stem cells so that when these maybe advancements come around, they can apply to their own. I think the key may already be in process in terms of studies that are being done, but it's it's just hard to know or access or afford it right now in terms of my humble uh, understanding of the field. So what might we need to achieve longevity escape velocity? I, I know right now a lot of the focus is on pharma, pharmaceuticals, right? Like supplements and 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 drugs um there there is also there are also like more moon tech stuff like stem cell therapy and and yamanaka factors and gene editing but what's the breakthrough that we are we are waiting for here gosh uh yeah you know from what i understand is like the the challenges of aging are like you know depending on what what literature you look at there's like seven to 12 you know harm mark, harm marks of aging and that it could it's it's a very tricky business and sometimes it feels like whack-a-mole from when you you kind of scientists describe it that you're trying to address a variety of faster factors instead of one kind of centralizing one i you know you i feel like the degradation of of cells or telomeres, the quality, just our overall metabolism or mitochondria, you know, those are the big things that come to my mind as someone who's, who's really tried to absorb as much as he can as someone who's not with a scientific background trying to understand it. I, what am my hope is that we can start seeing the, when you putting a database together like this, the 80, 20 of what, is maybe moving the needle when you cross-correlate like 
these the rate of aging tests people submit and future rate of aging tests, by the way, which I'm sure will get better and better, with all the protocol interventions that they're trying out. Ones that people can see, oh, this made a difference, especially from older individual, which is much harder to sustain that rate of aging. And these other people, I noticed they're getting rate of aging and they don't do these interventions. So maybe they're not as good. Uh, or like they don't have the greatest lifestyle, they eat sugar, but they do these other things and they still have a great pace of aging. You know, of course, genetics, maybe they could have a little edge. Maybe it's like that 10 to 15 percent edge of great genetics. But otherwise, uh, my hope is that we can really learn what's tipping the scale, what's really being like the the fulcrum, the, the lever, the biggest levers to help us extend lifespan so that as these advancements do come to the average person and become affordable to the average person, you're in a state that you can actually try them out. And so that's one of my exciting uh, thoughts about, you know, the potential of not just my database, but I'm sure there are lots of other probably um, other people maybe thinking about similar things or trying out studies that may become more of a database situation. So that's my hope that we can kind of identify correlations and exciting like 80, 20 like levers, you know? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So you know, are you familiar with the concept of paradigm shift? Vaguely, vaguely. Mm-hmm. I, I, I think it's Thomas Kuhn. Um, anyway, so, so, so the idea was that uh, before the concept of the paradigm shift was invented is that science is improving linearly, is getting better year to yeah. day. But that's not quite what's happening. Uh, science is, 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 is improving linearly, but some points we, we make a huge improvement, we, we make a huge discovery, and then we figure out, oh no, the science that we, we have learned, it's actually we have to throw most of them out into the trash and start in a lower level with this new paradigm and then start improving again, then we can go much further with that. And, but, but, but the question is, how do these paradigm shifts come along? And they don't come from the is existing scientific establishment. It tends to come from some, some crazy person, <laughs> someone who's, who's not, not in it. And you see, I, I think we might, I'm not claiming this is it, but I think we, this could be the, the thing that, that makes the difference. The, the longevity sport industry. And, and why, why am I saying that? So games, games, just, just general, the concept of games. In a game, you are an agent, uh, a player, and you have an aim and you have some rules. All right, that's a, that's a game, and a sport is a game as well. It's a it's a, it's a it's a special kind of game, but 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 the thing is that you know we are in games allowed to do stuff that we are not allowed to do anywhere else. So if we are playing poker, and um. You're asking me, uh, so, 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 so what card do you have? And I'm going to tell you, I'm going to, a king, I have a king, but I actually have a, have a queen. Uh, then, then, then what did I do? Well, I, I tried to trick you. I lied to you. I lied. And that's a big no-no in, in ethics, in everyday conversations. Like I can't, the lying is not a good thing, but in Booker, we, poker we just call it bluffing you know <laughs> it's just bluffing we we come up with different names for that uh, so so what what we what we have to notice is that games transcend ethics and they also transcend laws like look at all the fighting sports so in the fighting sports people are fighting each other but that's completely illegal in any other kind of context so, 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 so sportmen, uh, athletes are doing things. Those are not allowed in normal circumstances. The ethics committee of the scientific, uh, whatever is not allowing you to go through this, 
really crazy thing that might lead you to die uh, because you're trying so hard. But in sports, we are actually cheering for you that go go for the ball even if you die, <laughs> you know? Like, that's the power of sports. And the longevity sport, longevity as a sport, also brings this power, right? It, 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 it brings everything that we know about the games and people are trying not just going to their trying crazy things. And, you know, some of those crazy, crazy things might just work. So could this be the key to longevity escape velocity? Yeah, I, it's, I think with the increased, easy, and very inexpensive access we now have to our biometric data every day with like things like just a Fitbit, you, which you now can get for like a, a version of a wearable for like thirty, forty dollars now, where you're constantly tracking your information. Where uh, you can get an epigenetic test for um, where overall speed of aging for a couple hundred dollars, which you know who knows may even get cheaper over time as this uh, the field of longevity gets popular. With this increased access, where people have this immediate availability of their biometric data and the ability to assess it, to improve it, to play with it, to gamify their involvement, not with themselves, but with other people. If you look at other apps like Strava, where people aren't just tracking their own data, they're, they're having playful competitions with others. And, they, and this is without any effort on their part because it's automatically tracking their information. You can get a smart uh, scale where you step on it and it can estimate a whole ton of uh, information is it you know 100 percent accurate no but it gives you a, a vague assessment of maybe your your um your maybe bone density or your or general fat visceral fat you can uh, and of course your weight all these like metrics that you can track and make into a fun competition not just with your own goals with yourself but other people and as we get smarter and smarter and less expensive devices a way to track these this the possibility of gamifying and being more involved in your own health decisions and exploring possibilities i think just becomes more front of mind with everyone just like you know when banking for example was limited you go to the bank you get a little sheet print out of your bank holdings and that's it and then banking went online right and then, oh, I can check my banking all the time. Oh, I can see what deals I can make. Or maybe I can change your credit card and get more deals. And then Mint comes along, right? Mint.com back in the day. And you just plug in your bank account information. And it spits out all of these automated analytics about what you spend, maybe how you could spend money. And you're not having to manually add it anymore. It's doing it for you. And this just exploded people's willingness and excitement to be more involved in their finances, in their own future, without having to just rely on a bank teller or manager or funds account, um, you know, advisor, you know, people still do that, of course, but there's a home. I don't know if that meets the definition of a paradigm shift where people become more empowered into their own ability to take hold of their own destiny and their own lives. But it's a shift that I think happened to the financial industry as people got more access to their own data. And I think the same shift that's happening to our health information with the in affordability and access of these wearable devices, these different tools, whether it's a smart scale or a, I have all these like you know, little, little devices that t test your lung capacity or your wrist strength um, to kind of as uh, assess these important metrics that have strong correlations with overall longevity that we can be more, uh, more participants, participants in our health, um, health outcomes instead of just, you know, these people who wait on a doctor's appointments for 15 minutes every six to 12 months. And then the doctor is going to tell you some generic stuff and you go with, uh, you yeah. go with something. And anyway, um, rejuvenation Olympics yeah. was the first, it wasn't the first leaderboard, but it was the first real competition, you know, um, now, now, were you familiar with the Rejuvenation Olympics before the rule changes? Yes. I, yeah, and, I believe so. Yeah. yeah. So I, I wanted to ask you, what do you think about the rule changes that they made? 
recently. So my understanding, and correct me if I'm leaving anything out because I haven't checked in a little bit, is that you need to do like at least, now you have to do at least, uh, what is it, three uh, Dunedin Pace epigenetic tests within like a six-month period to like stay stay on. I, is that kind of the, the main thing? You have to do three, but I don't think it's six months. I think it's maybe two years. But, okay. Uh, okay. It, it, it has been a question in a previous episode, and okay. we, we, we were not not able to figure out the answer. But yes, three tests now. Um, and yeah, I'm curious. Do you after those two years, do you disappear from the from the board? Is that the uh, assumption? You just poof. You're gone? Good question. Good question. <laughs> I, yeah. I, uh, I personally, this is what if if I had the power, I might. This is my what I might do. I might say like, I would put like a little date on the side, one more column that would say, hey, this is one when he was last updated, right? And so if it's been a couple of years, I wouldn't like have them gone. I might say, you know, just like have that notation there so that. So look, here's it's twofold. On one hand, we do want to encourage more people to add and update the information that's exciting, but I think the information people have shared uh, is still worthwhile and interesting to know who these people are. So I would just add a add extra column to to simplify it and say this is the last date they updated, and people can see if they haven't uh, updated their information in like you know five years or five years from now, people can say okay, I'll take this with like. A grain of salt. They've, you know, maybe their things have changed in their lives, or they haven't updated in a while. But still interesting to know. And then other people can know oh, this people person is more recent. That that's my thought of it. Or maybe they could have like a little old, oldies database on the side for people who haven't done a couple of years, but it still be interesting to know. I love having all the data, and if it's just older, then just just classify it there on the side somewhere. But that's just me. <laughs> okay, so. You would you would show people when they have done something. Um, I've also been thinking about the design of this, and w- what I would be doing. Uh, I'm I'm curious about your opinion here. So what I would be doing is that always the lowest pace of aging matters, mm-hmm. but every year the competition restarts. So what would that result into? Um, Brian Johnson who has a lot of money, mm-hmm. he would do every single day three times a pace of aging test and he would make sure that the the lowest one that he ever done, you know, like that would, would get there. Um, Julie Gibson, who can only do one test a year, she would try to figure out, okay, what, when is the best time for me to, to do this? And then she would pinpoint, okay, this is the winter time. That's when I'm the best and winter in the morning, blah, blah, blah. So this way you could put Julie Gibson and Brian Johnson against each other. And every year the competition would restart, which would generate new events. People would have to buy new tests, right? Uh, Revenue model, very important. What do you think about that design? Yeah, I think it's pretty. It's a cool idea. I I think maybe having two separate uh, lists. One is like the yearly one that gets started every year, and um, you know, and maybe you know maybe there's a limit on how many times you can like uh, submit your score. I think uh, because there is that advantage, right? It's, it's a couple hundred dollars. It's it's not like the most expensive in the world, but it is it can be a pretty penny, especially if you're doing more than one. So maybe uh, preventing like the the people who have the most money from having an edge, maybe limiting it to like three or four or something like that, just so there's there's some sort of mechanisms that you know we, we can all be on the same approximate playing field, you know, like uh, maybe three or something like that, and then having a separate one for all like the the previous uh data that's that's out there right and you can also have a little column that says how many times you've you submitted your test and like if it's if it, if it's an average or if it's the best i think that's a cool idea and it'll spark like renewed interest and excitement every year like oh it's starting up again 
and that's cool. And if you want to see the past, like, kind of archive of information, you can look up, the, you know, the oldie leaderboard or leaderboard, you know, 1.0 or however you want to phrase it, you know? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Who, who's the Mr. Olympia, Mr. <laughs> Longevity Olympia yeah, this Ms. year? <laughs> Mr. Mrs. 2024. Yeah, Mr. Mrs. 2020, or however you identify, you know, like 2024, 2025. Yeah. So, so, so another, well, let, let's not, let's not gloss over the most important change, which was that, well, instead of 20 people, now we have all the people, right? Which, which is pretty awesome. And yeah. also it's, it's updating in real time, right? Because the previous one was not updated for an entire year, you know? Yeah. Like, uh, people were complaining, is it dead or not? But uh, anyway, another change that they did, and I think I would roll it back <laughs> if I could, uh, which is that they had an absolute leaderboard there. The, they had two leaderboards. The second one was absolute one. They called it an absolute leaderboard, which was based on the ages of the chronological ages of the people. So how much did you improve compared to your chronological age? Yes. Right. So right. we ended up with people who are really old, but have really low Dunedin pace. And I think those people were really interesting, right? Because they were able to turn back their Dunedin pace in their 70s and 80s, right. which, which is something that I, I, I think we should look at these people more than, than someone who is 16 years old and <laughs> have a low Dunedin pace, right? Yeah, and that's part of the inspiration of of the database I like to do. And just to, just to clarify, um, from my database, you get to the top by with the more information you share, right? Because that's the whole information, crowdsourcing information. Even if you're not the slowest aging person in the world, if you share the most information, because that's the goal, to crowdsource information so we can all benefit and learn, you get to the top. And if every, you know, and then if more the same people share the information, then people take turns with their 15 minutes of fame. But... Uh, part of the information that I include is the date you're, I asked for, if people want to share on the database, is exactly what you mentioned. What is the age you took the test? What is your, and what is the speed of aging when you got the test done? And if people want to um, dive into like, oh, wow, this is really intriguing because this person has like a 0.75, but they're 70, and this person has a 0.75, but they're 30, that's a big difference, and people will will appreciate having this, uh, being able to distinguish between those two, especially if you're an older person where it's harder for you to sustain maybe these health or protocols. So that's my goal. And um, I think, you know, the more we can just welcome everyone in, even if they're in the t- not the top, you know, 10 or even 100 and welcome their information, the more we can all benefit and in, and improve. So I just wanted to kind of build on what you were saying, that excitement of, but, you know, increased data really gives us more food for thought um, as we explore these beyond just and now, you know, I, I don't think they have the the age the person was when they took the test. They just had the rate of aging. And I think, you know, people should feel, feel comfortable leaving out whatever they want to feel, leave out. But it would be really great if they included the column again for people who are willing to share how old they were when they took the test, because the more information that can be shared, the more we all benefit. That's just that's just my geek data geek thought process. Yeah, so so let, let me reiterate that so it sinks in that um, in your database, there are two criterias of ranking good. One is to share as much information as you can, and the second is recency, how recently you've you've shared those information. So yeah. just to just 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 to say that right now on top of that list is none other than me <laughs> because <laughs> I, i've submitted the most recently so whoever is listening to this if you wanna well come at me bro <laughs> yeah really gibson yeah. julie gibson clark um is just right under you and i just have like a couple of things to update that i'll you know share with her so it might be a competition between you two for a little bit but yeah i'm i'm very excited to share you know this is uh, completely free to 
to join and share, you know, and just to remind people because they're curious, does you own my health information? No, I don't own your health, health information. If you do share it, if you ever want it updated or removed entirely, that is totally your call. And um, we're just here. It's like Wikipedia. If you want to share to help the betterment of society, especially in the context of the longevity field, it's it's a very exciting prospect for us to learn from each other. And if you want to be anonymous, you know, if you want like a cool name, um, mystery name, that's cool too. If you want your real name and as and all and you want me to link to one of your socials as a as a thank you, give you a little social media boost. I'm happy to do that. You know, I've done that with a lot of other people. Uh, and you may be this. I don't know if you've heard this recently. I think it's happened within the last month. But have you seen two particular famous uh, influencers who took their their uh, uh, speed of aging test? I'll give you a clue. There are two women, uh, well, very well known women. Kardashians. Uh, the Kardashians. Two Kardashians. They're right. on. They're on the board. They haven't filled out the survey, but they did do publicly share their information. So I created like a fan page, a fan record, and I'm going to reach out to the publicist saying, "Hey, you're on the board. If you want to add anything, you know, feel free. I don't know if they'll bite, but we'll see. But yeah, it's exciting because now, like, you know, people outside of the field of longevity are are curious, and I think that's only going to grow over time that's just my humble opinion so chloe kardashian kardashian uh 0.72 dunedin piece which is pretty good it's pretty good 39 years old and king kardashian 0.82 43 years old yeah uh, all right all right <laughs> i know it's exciting i think they went to a longevity dinner one of those um dinners with uh, brian johnson or the first first su first suppers i think he's called them um where they all meet and dine and uh and philosophize and all that all that good stuff and uh and i think maybe she got like intrigued by, by that i think i think don't don't quote me <laughs> but i think that's what happened <laughs> yeah possible um are you familiar with the concept of lean canvas Lean canvas, no, please, please share. There, there, there was this movement where it's not new anymore, but this lean startup uh, movement, and there, there was a, there was a small booklet, a small one-page document called the Lean Canvas, and they said that if you are, if you are launching a business, then these are the things that you wanna have in mind. So. I really like this and been using this since forever just to just to organize my thoughts and I would like to go through uh these these categories with with you these okay. these topics with you so and I I know some of these you've already um explained but now I'm going to point the questions to you so and now you have to either explain it again or explain it more consciously. So sure. goalie.com, what's the problem you're trying to solve? The problem is that all of this amazing health protocol, longevity uh, data in the form of epigenetic test results and health correlating um, health protocols are all scattered across the internet. They're not in a centralized uh, database that people can analyze efficiently at the very least and that is a loss to the field because uh the more we can analyze even even though this is majority self-reported data you know i'm not claiming this is like studies but there's a major loss uh from the collective wisdom uh that we can all generate from each other by not centralizing this information together and also there's a loss on the the growth of the field in general from not kind of pulling all these amazing people and information together that could also lead to more funding for uh, more studies and more interventions that could bring about uh, exciting possibilities for longevity in the close in the nearer future than now so that it's it becomes a little bit you know so the field becomes more acceptable more mainstream People don't raise their eyebrows quite as much when you talk about longevity. I think we're all missing out um, because we're not bringing all this great information together. That's 
that those are all the the problems that I'm trying to solve. So, so if you want to study the slowest aging people in the world and don't want to listen to hundreds of hours of my podcasts, then you go to <laughs> goalie.com and check the raw data out. Yeah. Um, all right, let's let's design the product. So, what's the solution? My humble part of helping the longevity field grow in this in the manner that I, I mentioned, the solution of bringing uh, empowering people with more information is the the collection. At least the first phase. And maybe I'll I'll get um, an epiphany and have a, a more uh, um, additional kind of cons- more ideas. But for now, the first step is to organize this information together and really to work on just growing as much as possible because the more data points you have across the different age ranges, across different health conditions, uh, across different interventions that are being done, like rapamycin. By the way, at some point I can mention, like, I'm about to share... Um, launch like a rapid mycin database because it's like one of the most exciting and promising uh, prescription medications out there in in the field. And again, as far as I'm aware, you know, there's been some polls done like on the awesome website rapidmycin.news. There's not like a centralized database where we can gather this information from. Um, so creating databases is the first step. And then once the database results come in, start coming in, and you start seeing really strong correlations between these epigenetic tests that will, I believe will get better and better or additional t- multiple tests that will get better and better. I don't know if Symphony Age or, or other things will come along and replace it. As all these information grows, you, we're going to see uh, correlations between certain uh, health choices people make, certain interventions. And then we can say, okay, maybe we should really dig deeper into this one thing. Maybe we should dig deeper into... Uh, NMNs or NAD or calorie restriction. Maybe we should have a database that that digs more deeper into that. Or maybe we should talk to someone who specializes in studies. And those people who do studies, they can reach out to these people on on the database I'm creating and say, hey, like we noticed there's really interesting results coming out of your health interventions. Could we um, entice you into being part of a study? And, you know, we're all tapping into this collective uh, longevity network ultimately to learn from each other, to accelerate the pace of what are the most impactful interventions there are. So with our with the average person's limited time and money, they can maximize as much as possible until more powerful interventions come and they help us like uh, get back to a baseline where we can, you know, have a chance for the next intervention. You know, that idea of that exciting idea of longevity escape velocity uh, for the for the average man, uh, for the average man or woman or however you identify, because the reality is I think a lot of people think like these are eccentric millionaires, the realm of eccentric millionaires who have access to all these exciting interventions. But I think there are still some, there are a lot that we can do as I'm, I'm not rich, I'm a middle income person who can take charge of our, uh, our health, our longevity, and even experiment with certain things. Maybe experiment with... Um, you know, rapamycin or or certain things under the proper supervision of a medical professional, just if and try things out. And as we learn, as things become more affordable, try out other interventions. And there's there's other other you know interventions that are also less than a thousand dollars that I'm not just thinking of right, right now. That as more people share what they're doing, people can say, oh, I can't afford like you know ten thousand dollar gene therapy, but I can afford this variation of it this maybe this peptide injection or or this molecule that's shown results from these all these other people uh and let me see what happens and then we just build momentum as more and more people share information if that makes sense are you familiar with michael lasgarden yes yes a really interesting guy exciting guy he's one of the rejuvenation olympian and he has a very methodological data-driven approach right he's looking at statistical correlations between his diet and his mm-hmm. different biomarkers including pace of aging now i started to do it myself as well this statistical trickery not exactly of the things that he's doing so 
what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to look at things that I have a lot of data on, um, which is, you know, the variable is giving me a lot of data and I am now noting exactly what I'm eating for the last month. And what I'm trying to, to, to point out here is that I noticed that ordering has an activity tracker and it's trash it i cannot trust the data from that so i have a problem if i include that trash data then I, 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 the, the, the results the what i'm going to get from this is, is is going to be garbage as well because garbage in garbage out right <laughs> so how do you think about and content with the integrity of the data that you're gathering? Yeah. Uh, by the way, I just want to mention one thing. I use the term eccentric millionaire as tongue-in-cheek. Brian Johnson, if you're listening, I don't think you're an eccentric millionaire. So thanks for all you're doing. <laughs> um, second of all, uh, so quality control, right? I think in general, just like most things in life, you do the best you can with the information you have available. You know, if you can't afford like DEXA scans or these, you know, I, I forget what they call them, Pronova, like body scans or these genetic tests for hundreds of, of dollars, I think you you take your uh, you take your wearables with a grain of salt. Uh, you take like those the smart scales you can get like on Amazon for like thirty dollars. You, you take them. You take the data with a grain of salt, and then. I think my mentality is like I save up for like maybe once a year. My thought is like save up once a year for like a DEXA scan or a very comprehensive like blood panel test. And then I look at my data and th that I take on these wearables and then I cross correlate with with that official reading. And then I give myself a handicap. I say, OK, this is, you know, the difference between uh, this information about like my VO2 max from my estimations versus this official VO2 max test I did is the difference of like, you know, um, the five uh, in terms of like, it's a 45 in terms of a test on, on myself. It's a 50 or whatever, there's a difference. I just incorporate that handicap more and more every year. And I say, okay, I just keep that in mind. I think for the for most people, it, I think that's that's the, that's a simple answer. It's I know it's not perfect. I wish we I think things will become better over time with technology as as it generally is. But I think until then we just we just factor in that handicap as much as possible. I see. Um another design question here. I see you're using the need and pace just like the rejuvenation Olympics, but there are of course many more things that could be uh, looking at like telomeres, omic M age, uh, fen pheno age, symphony age, power watt clock, uh, whatnot. So, why did you settle on the need and pace? You know, I just wanted to simplify it to start with because I'm not a known quantity in the field yet. So I wanted to like uh, just say, okay, people are familiar with this based on the rejuvenation Olympics. That's what they used. And there's already some data out there. Right now, it's a third-generation epigenetic clock. It's, it's probably one of the most highly regarded and comprehensive versions of it. So let me just start off with, with that because there's already data on it. It looks extremely promising. People are already using it for the Rejuvenation Olympics. So there's validation and allows me to be consistent. However, uh, if someone has... Um, uh, a symphony age result or something else that's very modern and you know validated then I, i'm definitely open to that and incorporating that into the field i think when you get into like older generation clocks like you know maybe it's maybe it'd be nicer to have like the more recent versions at least that's why i'm like uh you know i'd rather have the third generation clock than maybe the the first or second generation, no offense to the scientists who created those, but that's my thought process. If it's modern, you know, and, and recent, I'm open to including that in the future. Or, or if someone has it now, they're like, I can't afford a, a dune in a pace, but I just did this symphony age, or I did something that is 
um, very recent, it's got some validation, then I'm open to including that. And then I'll just put like a little note saying like, hey, in a separate column, I'll say, hey, this is this is a symphony age column. It's not like, so people don't don't get confused. That's all. So I'm open to that. I think we can, we can learn from that. Uh, I think with any sort of database, it's really helpful if there's like a commonality to help compare people on. That's why I just started with that. So I'm, I'm just working with that right now, but I do want to be very inclusive. You know, we're just starting out and there's a, a financial element to it. It's a couple hundred dollars for doing and paste. And if you've just paid for a another modern test that's got validation in the field then i'm open to that just you know you can go to people are interested and it does something like that go to uh goalie.com slash uh support and now you can create a ticket say hey this is a recent test i got it's it's very modern validated this isn't like from you know three years ago um from an obscure you know company i'd be open to it it's just, you can see I have been thinking a lot about these things, <laughs> uh, and 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 continuing on the on the design truck that I brought up. That every year you you would clear the leaderboard and and a new competition would launch. That mm -hmm. that would also enable you to keep using new clocks every year, or 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 whichever clock that you find the best, or. Mm -hmm got the most cut from right like revenue is very important but from just the design point of view of of a leaderboard i i came to the conclusion that an epigenetic cloak that tells you a biological age is much cleaner from a software design point of view so you, right now we have this pace of aging mm -hmm. it it takes so if if i if i'm talking to someone like like someone who's not into longevity and epigenetic clocks right and i'm going to tell him about his biological age hey you're chronologically 30 but biologically 23 is like okay but if i start to tell him about the pace of aging that it creates more conversation and mental loops that they have to then accept and learn about. And what we cannot do well is rank people based on based on how the old rejuvenation Olympics were. Maybe this is the reason why they have abandoned that concept that, hey, if you're older and you have a lower Dunedin pace, then 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 you you get to a better place but but maybe they have they have had uh, some concerns about it. so okay so it's pace of aging and in the new zealand study it was like like okay the 30 years old people have 0 0.9 the 60 years old had zero uh, has 1.0 and then they, they had to do some, you know, some calculation to figure out and how do they really rank the people. But if you just have a biological age, then you can just say that, hey, this guy reversed six years of his life, right? That makes it cleaner concept. So if I would be designing something like this, then this is what I would be try to look for. A biological age clock instead of piece of aging clock. Oh, that's a good, that's good points for sure. All right, unique value proposition. What's what's your unique value proposition? There's no other database, longevity database, in the world, as far as I'm aware, that's incorporating a um, validated biological metric like speed of aging, as well as all of these other health protocols and interventions that I'm doing. And so it's not just diet, supplements, exercise. It's also the extent to which you do calorie restriction, if you do them at all, prescription medications that you may take related to the field of longevity, are you vegetarian? You know, uh, what to what degree do you have protein per pound? You know, all of these other metrics that people can choose to share. Uh, ideally, the more they share, 
you know, the better. I'm just, I'm excited, so excited for the possibility of using all this information together. Now, my thought is, you know, if someone wants to go through the effort of creating another database or doing something similar, I think that's great. You know, a rising tide lift all boats. But currently, no one has, as far as I'm aware, done an open dat- open longevity database. There have been studies. People are going to say, oh, there have been studies testing different elements, health protocols. That's true. But those are like, you can't know the the delineating information between people with that information. You can't know what percentage have these little variabilities in them uh, from these studies. The studies, you know, that's not up for you to kind of, up for you to be able to access. This is an open information, kind of like, you know, some ways like Wikipedia, for us to be able to learn from each other and potentially even connect with. That's the beauty of pe- for people who, who are open sharing the socials. They can connect and grow and network with each other. And it's, it's very exciting. People, as the database grows, people from across the, the age spectrum from, with different conditions can also learn from each other and participate. Some people may think this is just a young, young person's game. And I don't, I don't think there is, you know, uh, you've interviewed, uh, older individuals who are doing uh, great things with their health protocols and they're sharing, and maybe you find someone that is also your age or has a similar condition, health condition that you are, you have, and they're still doing exciting things with their health and experimenting. And I think the amount of information, open information that's being shared on the database I'm creating is completely unique as far as I can find does not exist anywhere and we can all benefit a lot from contributing to it and accessing it and sharing it. So at this point in time in his story, you only have to differentiate yourself from the rejuvenation Olympics because there is no (laughs) other thing here, but would it be fair to sum it up in a way that, well, the rejuvenation Olympics contains the results, what your, what goalie has it contains not only the results, but also the correlating factors that might cause the results. Yeah, I'm. I include the health protocol. I mean, you can you can consider me the expanded version of the rejuvenation Olympics in a way because it's like you know you have this one little piece. It's like a book. The rejuvenation Olympics is like having the first page of a book. And you're like, oh, I'm excited. I want to read the next chapter, next chapter. What happens to these people? What are they about? These characters that I'm just being introduced to in this book. And it's like, there's no second chapter. There's no other chapters. I, my, my database is creating a book out of these interesting uh, people and information that people can get excited about and read and explore the journeys and learn from. So, uh, yeah, Rejuvenation Olympics is, is great for the generating excitement uh, for the community. But I think it's it's it can be expanded uh, in a way that can help the entire field in general. In order for a product to survive long term and not be overtaken by competitors, you need to have an unfair advantage. So you can't be easily copied or bought. So how how do I keep that? Uh, how do I keep that advantage? Right. Well, I think effort is the moat. Uh, you know, it takes, there's the effort it takes to kind of keep putting this top of mind, reaching out to people on, you know, who are on these different communities um, and Facebook groups and saying, hey, I'd love to learn more about, you know, what you started sharing in your post. You know, it's completely free and we could all benefit from it and happy to promote you and feature you. It takes effort to like reach out to people and grow. Here's a spoiler. I'm not making i'm not making any money off this there's no fee to be part of this and so for someone to keep putting forth that energy reaching out to the community and getting this information and becoming like a trustworthy person that they are comfortable you know sharing even though it's relatively like basic information about your health that takes time and effort and energy and there's not you're not growing funds uh, just like there's a limited number of like, um, you know, Wikipedia versions out there. And there, that's because it takes time and effort to just share and, and moderate information. And that, that effort is a moat. 
I, I will say though, if someone does create another open database, I think that that'd be exciting. I don't feel like <laughs> threatened. I think my goal is to help the longevity community and, um, you know, if someone creates another database and maybe I, we could share information if it's an open database and they're like, you know, open to sharing information, we could grow, support each other and grow, uh, in the, in the community. So, yeah, I think the rising tide lifts all boats in this context. You know, I, I do other things outside of this. I help people like launch their own podcasts. That's my, my recent, um, my recent uh, service these days, and I'm excited to help people do that. So that's that's how I earn an income outside of this, and so that's what I'm excited about. Yeah, I'm I welcome anyone else to put in the effort to grow, you know, share, have a centralized database that shares all these different things, so we can we can all benefit from it. Are you familiar with Ludwig von Mises? I don't think so. He's one of the founding figures of Austrian economics. So. He wrote a book called Human Action, and when I was reading that book, there were some lines that really stuck with me there. He mentioned that all the military analogies that we are using in business are basically wrong. So if we are talking about something like strategy or tactique or conquering the market or stuff like that, these are wrong. We shouldn't use them because the market is not a zero-sum game. And the battlefield is a zero-sum game. So in a market, we are expanding and we are not like going after each other, like in a zero-sum game, in a competition. Uh, that's why monopoly is not, 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 a, not a good, good analogy for, for business, for real life. <laughs> but anyway, um, what, what, what the point is, the point is that I agree with you in a sense that it's, it's competition in the marketplace is not the same as competition in a zero sum sport game. And you mentioned, you mentioned that you're reaching out to people. So what channels the path to customers? What are your channels where you're reaching out to people? Yeah, so I just started because I wanted to have some a little bit of a validation existing first um, with with some data already on the leaderboard that I've gleaned from people who have already shared um, their information. And so I've just started reaching out. Jen, I you know the Telegram channel that Genvel kind of helps host ageless society yeah i've i've reached out to um just just a couple people there and i've reached out via email to to just a couple people like julie gibson clark it's a um the domain name goalie.com is new so i've got to work on like the email address going to a certain folder that i don't want it to go to just because it's new and uh, it was shared that that's how this mind went into that so trying different ways to reach out to people where it actually gets to them, first of all, and then I have enough data to show like, oh, this is legit. This is a legit project that someone's taking seriously. Um, you know, OK, I'm I'm curious. I'm going to share my information. They're, they're saying, you know, he's not going to own it and I can delete it whenever I want or update it whenever I want. There's all these reassurances in place. Then why not? It's not costing you anything and you can get some free free social media publicity um for whatever little bump i can give by with your name on the on the side of the database so it's kind of um you know purely beneficial situation once people see like what i'm asking you know not out charging anything who are your target customers customer segments uh well in terms of people who want to sh users who share the information i think it's it's the most exciting for like the the older individuals who are um, are doing well with their rate of aging, uh, because they are that's the most challenging, right? You know, I think there was an interview with Dr. Oliver Zolman, Zolman, MD, one of the co-creators of the of Brian Johnson. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and he's organizing all of Brian Johnson's like thirty doctor panel of, of people. And, you know, he was sharing how, you know, the older you are, the, inf the more information you can glean, the more kind of impressive it is that someone has 
retain a slower pace of aging because it does get challenging from a variety of factors as you get older, from what I understand. But I'll put a big asterisk on it. I, I, I'm i grateful for people all across the age spectrum and uh, whatever kind of state you're in. And, uh, you know, I, I know like the younger you get under 30, you know, you it's a little harder to read, to extrapolate. But definitely um, the older from 30, the more intriguing it gets. So if I can tell, you know, if they say I'm this age and this is my doing and pace, I definitely might be more gravitate towards them. But I'm definitely grateful for everyone. Oh, I just, just, this just came to my mind that if you're just looking at, I'm going to digress here, but if you're just looking at it from a mathematical point of view, it's like a pace of aging is something that, that's a, that's a, that that's a metric from what you should be able to calculate a biological age. But I think it's not going to happen because that might be a limitation of this model. But if if you if you measure the pace of aging someone every day and you start from X age and you 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 then say hey. You you aged this way and then this way and then this way. And this way. So that, that you could be able to tell that, okay, so now your biological age is is not fifty one from fifty, but fifty point six because your pace of aging is where this uh, from a mathematical model point of view, it should work like that, right? Yeah, I, I think there is some some trickery going on here, and it wouldn't work like that. Anyway, sorry, sorry, sorry no, for this. It's true. Okay, three more categories here in the Lean Canvas. Um, one thing that you do in longevity or health and fitness is that you're tracking your data, right? Like you're tracking data so you can make sure that you're on the right track. What are the key metrics of your product here? What things are you looking at and saying that, all right, I'm in the right path. It's getting traction. Yeah. So in terms of me personally and what, you know, um, the, the metrics that I think are so far most correlated with longevity are the like grip strength in VO2 max and maybe a, maybe some other like certain genetic tests like like doing a pace that gives you like an overall snapshot my plan is to put some of those also in the forefront like i have a little grip strength meter i have a, a lung measure it doesn't measure like vo2 max exactly it's something that brian johnson has that does something similar but uh you know keeping in mind uh, sleep quality as well. I think that's a big one. I think the more we learn about the overall health impacts of lack of sleep and all the processes that happen, good processes that happen when we get good quality sleep are quite a bit. I think people might just simplify, say, oh, I have less energy when I don't sleep, but otherwise I'll be fine. It's so much more than that. It, it affects our cognitive you know, uh, state of preservation or decline. It affects how, you know, how our muscles heal overnight. It, it affects all these different health issues. And yes, our wearables are, are definitely not perfect in terms of measuring quality, but I think they're a good, a good first step to just kind of assessing. Like every morning I look at my Fitbit, I see how many hours did I sleep? How much REM sleep did I get? What's the overall quality score that I get? Because I know how much that is going to impact my overall quality of health and preserve all the other interventions I'm doing. You know, I might have a great health. I might have a great workout routine and supplements, but if I'm not getting the, the quality sleep I need, it's going to contradict that and it'll be a real shame. So I guess you look at those certain metrics, you look at overall, I, I'm sure there are blood blood panel metrics that I, I should be doing that I, I, I want to do more of, but those are the main starting things that I, I look at. I look at my quality of sleep. I look at grip strength. I look at things that are a little harder to quantify, by uh, like energy level, ability to focus. And, um, yeah, as, as much as, as much 
information I can get from my wearables as I can and correlate that with how I how I feel and then these like once a year metrics are kind of factored together. I think that's that's kind of my my current methodology and now just looking at a certain limited key metrics but the beauty of having a database is that every day I'm checking I'm seeing like all these other tidbits that people are sharing and say oh you know people are spending more time focusing on on these certain uh metrics and information maybe I should be checking those as well so because the Metbit database is new I'm sure I'll discover lots of other interesting things I should be studying on a regular basis um, when I'm not like inputting data. What about the key metrics that signal the success of Gooley, like a uh, number of page views, a number of submissions? Number First and foremost, the number of the data points that are being contributed, the number of users that are that are being added and the amount of data that they're sharing. I'd rather have, you know, one user who's sharing like, 10 bits of information than a couple users who are just sharing like their rate of aging and then like one thing about themselves because it's hot it's harder to cross correlate that and i'm not really interested in like having a a leaderboard of um you know and a rejuvenation olympics leaderboard because that that already exists i'm not trying to just reinvent the wheel so the amount of people who are sharing a lot of information, to put it simply, is my first and foremost metric. Number two, like you mentioned, how many people are viewing um, this database, which I'll track you know, on the website by just overall visits, how many people are reaching out in general out of curiosity and asking you know, uh, information about it and curiosity or see, my plan is to start an email email list for people who want like little updates on how things are doing. I think all of these interests, all these elements together will help grow the accumulation of information that we can all benefit from. So information shared and then visitation and, uh, and so forth, I feel like are the, the two main things and general response, you know, are people excited? Are they reaching out and saying, Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm excited about the possibilities of this. You know, is there any other information you'd like you'd like shared or other ways to to be involved? I'd love to connect. I I'm very excited to connect with a lot of interesting people in the field, honestly. You know, I live in the in the DC metro area and it's not like San Francisco, unfortunately, where I think this is a much more mainstream. You know, I can't run over to Brian Johnson's house and knock on the door and having a fun dinner uh for supper with them, unfortunately. So uh, I think it's there are some there's definitely interest in the area. There's lots of biomedical, I think, uh, companies popping up in the DC metro area. But generally speaking, I don't think there's as big of community here than there could be, and I think they could spark interest. So I'd be really excited to form communities online, be, connect with more people online across the world, as well as in person in the metro DC metro area, or maybe do little do little road trips um, in the future. So all those elements, I guess I'm excited about. But yes, data uh, submitted is number one, numero uno. What about the costs involved? Obviously your time that you're putting into it. What else? Server, server costs? Or is, is there anything uh, yeah, so far? Well, huh. Yeah, fortunately, um, so I'm using Airtable and they have a free plan right now. And this is something like I'm passionate about and I, it's kind of fun to see this grow. So I do gain enjoyment out of it. Uh, I think as it grows and I can, you know, some of those people who who join, maybe they want to work with me for, for launching their own podcast about a passion they love doing. And then, you know, I can use some of those funds to maybe have a, uh, a virtual assistant and they can kind of handle like the manual like entry and cross you know cross information uploading all that good stuff for me and then that makes things more efficient there's not too much of a cost it's just starting right now and that's the the benefit of like of building momentum you get more momentum you get people connecting and you form all sorts of relationships and partnerships that you never knew were uh were possible and there's creates all sorts of exciting opportunities for collaboration 
and then I can create more efficient processes as as that interest grows and the database grows. And you know, all of all of these pontifications that I'm doing might seem very ambitious for for someone who has like uh, you know 20 people on their list at the time of this launch. But I think that's you should be excited about you know projects that I think can change the world. And I don't think it's overly um, wild and crazy to think that this could contribute in small ways and big ways eventually, depending on how how it grows. So, yeah, I think um, with currently it's minimal involvement. Uh, there's not really a financial cost. I do have the website, um, you know, hosts, but that's okay. That's not much. That's like $10 a month. Uh, so there's not much cost now. And if costs grow, that's only because interest has grows. Your interest has grown. And there's ways, lots of ways I can leverage that without ever selling people's data or owning people's data. There's lots of other ways I can leverage that interest that helps serve people and, you know, generate, provides the value for them and creates income for different services that they might want. So what do you think is the last topic of the Lean Canvas? Key element of something not yet launched. I don't know. You got me, you got me curious. Revenue model. Yeah. So, <laughs> so my thought process is that what I make, what I, what I predict will happen is that I think people from across all sorts of fields, rather, regardless of whether their primary occupation is in health, I think we are at the early stages of people getting excited about longevity field. And I think there are going to be some of them who want to share their life journeys. Like the reason they're going to share, I think, their data is because I think they, they're excited to share their life journeys and contribute to the world in general. And people who want to share their journeys and contribute to the world in general will want to do so in a variety of ways. And I love listening and learning to podcasts. And I, I love helping people launch them. And I think that kind of the customer profile of someone who shares something publicly on a database, you know, again, it's okay if you want to be anonymous, but I, I predict most people will want to like, or are comfortable sharing what they are. Also, they have people who would love to share their life story in a new way. And that would open up the possibility of working together to launch a podcast. Even if that podcast isn't just about their health journey, maybe they run an Etsy shop, Maybe they help um, help people in real estate, or maybe they do love, maybe they are a fitness coach or a health coach, and they want to share their journey and provide value to people. And that's what, uh, that's what I see as a revenue option. I, I think one day, maybe if, it, the, if I grow a community um, large enough that's interested in like coming together on a regular basis and having like a special community on the side, Having maybe a, a, like P, uh, Peter Tia has, you know, a community you can pay a little extra for extra premium things, um, like show notes and and maybe certain Facebook group or something. That could be neat and interesting and fun to work together and collaborate with people who want a little extra time and and connection. So those are the two things. So right now, uh, I'm, I think eventually some of those people who want to share their their health journey want to share more and grow their podcasting. Now, it's totally okay if you want to share your health and you have no interest in podcasting at all. That's fine. Uh, I th- but I do think that will be the revenue ultimate process, the revenue kind of stream that will come as a result of this. And again, I'm sure there will be really interesting collaborations with other, you know, maybe uh, wellness clinics or supplement companies, uh, you know, who maybe, maybe they want to, I don't know, maybe they want to share a post at the top of the goalie database. Maybe they want to put something on top. Maybe maybe they want to share something. I don't know. Uh, I'm not, that's not on top of my mind right now. I know it's like the first thing that might come to people's minds. Like you could work with supplement company or something. And I, I don't feel the need to do that right now. I don't see that in the near future. Is it possible? Uh, yeah, uh, that I could do maybe a little, um, a little link on top or, or an or a little, you know, banner on top of the page and see if it's, if I think they're a quality company and they generally can help people and it's relevant. Sure. Why not? There's all sorts of collaborations that can be done uh, on the web page or on the podcast that I have. Again, the same name, G-O-A-L-Y. There's all sorts of collaborative opportunities there. But my first thing is just the, the podcast uh, launch support that I give 
uh, to people currently. I am an evil capitalist, <laughs> and I partly approve what you just said. <laughs> what I like is that you have ideas. You're trying to think about these things. But on the other hand, let, let me explain something very important. You are an entrepreneur. Oh, maybe I'm not an entrepreneur. No, uh, uh, like uh, in this model, every single person is an entrepreneur, all right? So it's like an Austrian economics model. The entrepreneur is the, the person who is moving things. So, and you are moving things. So you're an entrepreneur. And what you're trying to do is that you're trying to create value. You're trying to put some things together that the parts independently are le less valuable than the way that you are putting them together. All right. So, so now you have something supposedly valuable, but now you have a problem. You have to communicate about that value that you just created, because if you don't tell about it to anyone, then <laughs> it's a, it's a problem. All right. So you're doing that. You're communicating it. You're here, right here, communicating it to other people. Uh, and now the thing is that you have to exchange the thing that you're, you're creating the value um, and other people must be willing to pay money for it. Because if they are not willing to pay money for it, then how do you know that what you're creating is valuable? Yeah. So I think the, the fact that it costs like a couple hundred dollars to get the Dune and Paste test is filtering out a bit towards people who are will taking it more seriously. I think the average person may be just a little curious about health and longevity isn't just giving $200 or taking, you know, a finger prick of blood and <laughs> submitting it to a lab. I think that naturally says, okay, you're putting in extra time, money, effort to be part part of this community. Uh, I think that that in is of itself is showing like okay there there's someone who is showing that they 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 value it now i want to pause and say look there are people who are a really tight um forces they, they don't they're not making much money and they want to be involved and i'm not i'm not trying to tr throw any shade we've all been there um so that's why i hope that these tests as they become as longevity field becomes more popular in general the economics of scale will reduce the cost of these epigenetic tests as they improve much like you know genetic sequencing was like a million dollars and now it's you know you can get a robust genetic testing for like a thousand dollars which again is a pretty penny but it's nowhere near like the the million dollars it was when you know i don't know 20 years ago when these kind of genetic tests were coming out and i i hope it gets less expensive i i do you know and i think you know the cost can come in different ways this kind of proof of people's interest and seriousness can come in different ways right if they're taking the time to maybe do a uh, a vo2 max test with um with someone, like let's say they record it on video, they record like a Cooper test where they run uh, a test and they record it, right? And they and they submit that to me or something like that. Maybe we could do that in the future. You know, maybe they can't afford a true test, but they can do a Cooper test and they can they can prove it with the with a video clip. There's different ways to get around the the cost limitations because I do feel for those those people. I'm not I'm certainly not rich either. I wish I was. I'd love to do more genetic tests. So even myself, I, I do limit all these tests that I do, uh, but I am serious, just like I know other people in my situation are also serious. And I think, you know, there's different ways to get around and demonstrate your seriousness, if you put it simply. You see, <laughs> I just, I just, uh, <laughs> I've been preaching evil capitalism in this <laughs> podcast since the very beginning. And now the irony just hit me that well i'm not actually making any money and this is my full-time job for the past year <laughs> but but i have a good reason because you know i i don't know how else would i be motivated and improving my health in such a big way if i wouldn't be involved in this professionally 
So that's my my selfish reason <laughs> for not yeah. making it's money. A, it's a great product byproduct, isn't it? Being involved in this community, like it just naturally happens because it's front of mind, right? Yeah, it's exactly so. If if someone want to know how to lose weight, I don't know. Launch a podcast. Like <laughs> I don't know any other way. Um, so an interesting thing is that, you know, this is very small business right now. Um, True Diagnostic is probably the largest epigenetic testing company in the world, and they sold seventy thousand tests so far. That's 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 what that's like. 10, 10 million dollar. <laughs> that's basically nothing, you know, compared to that they they have to like also the equipment that is necessary to do the epigenetic tests. Um, I I I I heard it from a person I've been talking to, and I don't want to say anything stupid. But I think it's two hundred thousand dollar, right? So, and that's for the Horvath test. So, so, so anyway, so, 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 so the point is that it's, it's a really small market now, but in the future it's going to be much bigger, um, especially things improving, right? Like, for example, this system is system is symphony age. Syst- uh, by the way, sy- symphony age is the true diagnostic marketing term for the system age research paper right <laughs> so so system age or symphony age is is actually like getting really useful you know you, you get you get data if it works and it it seemed to give me the results that i suspected it should give me then it gives you results on different organ systems right how well you are is like you're in a video game, like twenty mm-hmm. percent kidneys, eighty uh, percent lungs, <laughs> and so on. So, but this gives a practicality to this whole epigenetic things because now you know that. Well, if you wanna improve your health, then what are you going to do? Well, the current answer is lose weight and build muscle, right? Like that's what we do. But what if? The answer in the future would be, okay, so do a system age test and, well, you find that your lungs are terrible, so then you're going to, you're still going to exercise, like you're not going to get away from exercising, but now you're going to focus on exercises, those are improving your lungs um, instead of, you know, something like, like, like muscle stuff, right? Um, so, 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 so this is getting practical, this epigenetic approach with the system age stuff. It's exciting. Yeah. I, I can't wait to see, uh, the, I don't think they've, they've released the, the system age leaderboard, but I love, I can't wait. I did hear, I, you did mention the podcast. There was a little bit of a leak at one point. I missed that, that leak, but I can't wait to share uh, when they do share it and, and what, how it looks like. And I think the more comprehensive we can find about, you know, different organs, the better. It's very convenient for me to have like a one simple number um, for rate of aging to put in a database to extrapolate from. But from a beneficial perspective, it's the more nuance you can get about your health, one's health, and the more they're willing to like share that nuance, the better, of course. So I'm excited for all developments related to the gene and pace or epigenetic uh very test variations coming in the future oh one one more thing i i wanted to mention is that so i'm interviewing you now uh about goalie.com and because of that previously the name of my series my podcast series was rejuvenation olympics right now I changed it to Immortal Combat. <laughs> okay, so I changed it to Immortal Combat uh, because now I think I'm branching out to to look at more sporting events in the longevity space, right? Okay. But where where did that Immortal Combat come from? Uh, you might have noticed that I've been giving some thoughts about this, uh, how to design this. Uh, 
this longevity sport and that was my working name of how would I call a longevity competition that I would launch. Um, first, I wanted to go with the Tournament of Immortality, yeah. <laughs> like Dragon Ball Tournament of Power. But and and that's good because that's that's pretty unique compared to how like it sounds like should already be a tournament of immortality somewhere on the internet, at least a game or something. But there is no. But uh, Immortal Combat actually sounds much better, but it's not that unique. Uh, anyway, this is this is my working name for it because I want to launch a longevity competition in the future. It just uh, there are two two problems I have. One is that it's not making. I'm I'm not sure if it would make enough money. I need a billion dollar for various mm-hmm. reasons. Um, that's for another time. <laughs> um, but. But also, I want to, I don't like to serve a market that's already served, right? So if I don't figure out something that differentiates me enough from the rejuvenation Olympics, then I don't want to du- duplicate something, you know? So, so yeah, it's uh, exciting for me that you launched Kohli. I can I can learn from your successes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the exciting thing about having this open information available that we can, you know, connect with each other and learn from each other and reach out if people share their socials and say, hey, I noticed you're you're trying this uh, this treatment or intervention. Like, you know, can I ask you some questions or can we compare notes or maybe like in your case, you can host some sort of biometric a longevity competition in any of these many different areas that people are trying to extend their their health span especially as more metrics are being gathered from wearables all the time too so yeah it's um and then there's like no code you know reduced code solutions for different apps that maybe they could pull from uh wearable data like fitbit data since my understanding is that they have uh you know open relatively open apis maybe there's some you know there'd probably be some cost ultimately for like regulating or like going back and forth for some of that data but there's also for exciting possibilities in the space i have a question do you which which longevity athletes do you know so uh i would say i'm trying to so i've been following of besides brian johnson the the big wig julie gibson clark who have actually connected with and who's probably the most the person who most in like these uh, rejuvenation Olympics related like news articles that people have followed. Marius Krebs has shared a lot of information on his page. Uh, Genvel, um, Peter Diamandis is a, as a very, is a very well-known person in the field too. He shares a lot of information. David Pasco, who you've interviewed. I'm, I'm excited about that. Simland is probably one of the the most famous um, you know guys out there too in terms of you know longevity influencers. Ironically, I know the least about like Chloe and Kim Kardashian than any other person on my Olympics board, even though they're probably two of the most famous people in the world, uh, just because of my interest in longevity. And Jeffrey Gladden. Uh, Michael Lustgarden has shared so much, and uh, you know Chris Maribel, who's you know. When founder. when you say they shared so much, it means that they shared on Goalie. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, oh. Generally speaking, on their websites, I'm I'm mm-hmm. just now like reaching out to some of these people to to share like, hey, I created a fan page, and I love to share more information if you like. But I've already pop, I'm already populating their information from what they've publicly shared on their websites and their generosity for sharing that information. So those are the people that that I just mentioned I'm most familiar with because they're their generosity in sharing, I guess. Oh, I see, I see. All right, all right. Uh, and Audrey de, <clears throat> de, de Grey, although he's not on the leaderboard, but, you know, the big wigs in the, in the space. Do, do um, you know his space of aging? I, 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 I have a feeling that he... Well, I, I'm pretty sure I've heard him saying... Something like, 
he's the worst example of a longevity guy because he's he's drinking and he doesn't like keep himself to high standards. <laughs> Yeah, he's like the longevity rebel. Like he's the bad boy. Like yeah. I don't, you know, I don't need to do. Yeah, it's okay. I admit it. I don't do all the all the stuff, and that's that's okay. We still value you all of the scientific research and discovery, of course. Yeah, it's 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 always interesting to hear people's perspectives and philosophies on it. And if that ultimately gives them the most joy, you know, not trying different things, then hey, you know, you do you. That's that's, that's totally cool. There is this rejuvenation Olympics now that wrongs people how well they are doing in rejuvenation. And, you know, I, I hear many opinions. People are saying that, well, now I don't even listen to people who are not on the rejuvenation Olympics because what do they have to tell me? <laughs> I think that's a huge mistake. This was the exact same case in the bodybuilding era, right? Like, I have bigger muscles, therefore my arguments are right. <laughs> you know, like, that's not how that works. That's not how that works. But uh, there is something to it. <laughs> okay. All right. Contrary on question. So we, during this conversation, I, I noticed when you said something about Brian Johnson, even if it wasn't kind of on the edge but not that much and then you always like corrected yourself oh but i don't mean it i don't mean <laughs> to hurt his feelings eccentric <laughs> billionaire but but don't worry now you have a chance of saying something that will hurt other people's feelings <laughs> because they will disagree with you because my question is what's one thing that you believe strongly to be the case but many people disagree with you on. I was I was thinking about this beforehand because I had watched your interviews and I, I'm wondering if mine's not just juicy enough. I think the Rejuvenation Olympics, as I've alluded to, is has so much potential that they're not tapping into. They have access to however thousand seventy thousand people taking the test. And, uh, you know, that I understand there's legalities of, like, making sure people are okay with sharing inf information. Um, but if there was if there was a way people could share more than just their rate of aging, which is really just all they're doing on that board, we would all benefit uh, so much. And I don't mean to be greedy because they don't have to even do this. You know, this is, I'm grateful they have, uh, but I think there's, they're missing out great opportunity and, uh, I, it would be so exciting if they tap, tapped into that. And, you know, one of the things I'd like to do is reach out to the true diagnostics and, and like Hannah, I think you've had on your show. She seems like so interesting about her history and what she's trying to do with the company. It would be great to connect with her and see like, Hey, is there a way we could get to connect with more people either through my database or share more on the on your um, Olympics leaderboard? So it's not not so limited, you know. Uh, I, I can try to think of something juicier if this that is that's not uh, contrarian enough. But I think the um, the idea of like these this number uh, speed of aging itself has very little interest in me just having that number itself. I'd rather have uh, one person share, like, who's in, like, the, you know, who's at 0.88 sharing all their health metrics. I think that's more beneficial for for longevity, you know, field in general than, than a, like, 10 people who are the fastest speed of aging, but we don't know anything about how they got there, except the great benefit of raising awareness and excitement. But... I think there's so much more possibility that could be tapped into. Look at the bright side. If they would, then you would not have a unique value proposition anymore. Yes, exactly. And that's why I am so grateful. And I, I, I don't want to sound like, uh, you know, that I don't appreciate what they started because if they didn't have that starting information uh, to start with, it would be much harder for me to have found these people to start 
the database I'm doing, or there wouldn't be as much excitement in general about uh, the soul field in general. And Brian Johnson, who's trying all these really interesting open experiments that he's sharing, you know, too, I think all of these things are awesome to the field and have helped ultimately helped contribute to what I'd like to do with the database. So for sure, I definitely <laughs> am grateful. So you, you see, by the way, for the Immortal Combat competition, I do not plan to collect the data, but I, I do plan to give ammunition for those who want. So, so this, there are two things that I want to do if I ever launch this thing, is that one is that there should be a contact information column. So whoever wants to find them, like, you know, if you go on the Olympics, you don't compete anonymously, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like that's yeah. not how it works. A sport competition is about your getting street cred, bringing, you are the champion of your country. You're not trying to be anonymous, right? So, so th that's what the sport is. Uh, it's so embedded that we don't even think about that. Um, but but another thing that I want to do is that if someone wants to rank in the tournament of immortality, they will have to agree to get an interview with with me or whoever yeah. is going to do the interviews. Now I'm not going to do the interview with everyone, right? But 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 there must be an agreement. And if someone doesn't appear on the interview then then they are not getting there, right? Because uh, as you said, it's important for people to see who are the slowest aging people in the world because otherwise, why are we even doing this if we are not learning from it? That's a big benefit. So, and if someone's really scared about putting themselves out there, they maybe they could turn off their camera and there could be a voice modulator, but they could still share all their information or something like that, you know, like ways to still, we could still learn from each other. And if, and preserve anonymity if they really want to. But yes, I think we benefit the most when we share more than just a, a singular a singular metric for for the, for the sake of kind of a, like a leaderboard situation. I wonder if you have any other side hustle. Can people give you money somehow for provided value or <laughs> not? Yeah. Um, so uh, thank you. This is very nice for you to ask. I, I think it's really nice for you to ask all of your people. Uh, all your interviewees there. Uh, it, if you'd love to, if you'd like to learn more about launching a podcast, I've been um, kind of focusing time on like starting this uh, database now, but I'd love to chat with anyone if they want to chat about the possibility of launching a podcast and growing a business out of it, uh, sharing their story. That'd be, that'd be awesome to chat with. Otherwise, uh, I'm just happy to learn more about you on the longevity database as well. Sean Patrick. Goalie.com, G-O-A-L-Y.com. I am on the top and it is lonely at the top. So guys, please come at me and <laughs> and, and get my crown yeah. from you my head see, and see throw it in secrets. there. See all of his health, everyone can see all of your health secrets. So you can go on now and check them out. Yeah. Thank you very much. That was great.